Welcome again to this series of lectures on post-colonial literature. Now, in our previous lecture, we uh, discussed Joseph Conrad's novel Heart of Darkness and how that novel provides a contrapuntal reading of the colonial discourse on Africa. But we ended our previous lecture with a very important question and the question was, can there be a contrapuntal reading of the novel itself? Can there be a contrapuntal reading of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, the text? Now, you will have to understand here that in spite of the sharp criticism of the colonial discourse which uh, was emanating from the West and the kind of sharp criticism of that discourse that we find in Joseph Conrad's uh, novel Heart of Darkness, we will have to remember that Joseph Conrad himself was finally a Western author who was situated in England which was one of the biggest colonial metropolis of the last century and his novel Heart of Darkness in spite of its criticism was itself published by a publisher situated in uh, the metropolis and in spite again of all its criticism of the West, its primary readership was a Western audience, was people located in the colonial metropolis. So, on the one hand we have Heart of Darkness as a very sharp and incisive criticism of Western ideologies and on the other hand we find that this criticism too is emanating from the same centre which is also forging the colonial discourse. Therefore, the question is, is it not possible that heart of darkness, though it is critical of the metropolitan colonial discourse, is not radically separated from the bias and the prejudices of the metropolitan societies which were based on colonial exploitation? The answer to this question as we shall see during the course of this lecture is a big yes. Indeed, Conrad and his novel Heart of Darkness can be found sharing certain, certain important ideological premises with the colonial discourse in spite of its criticism of the colonial enterprise. And this becomes evident if we try and read the novel contrapuntally or in other words, if we try and read the novel from a perspective from which its novelist, from which the novelist Joseph Conrad never intended it to be read. So, what can this other perspective be? What can this alternative perspective be? Well, it is a perspective of the colonized Africans, a perspective that is as again we will see during the course of our uh, lectures, following lectures, that this perspective, the perspective of the colonized Africans is crucially lacking in the novel and therefore this can give us that alternative perspective from which we can have a contrapuntal reading of the novel itself because the novel was never meant to be read, at least by Joseph Conrad, by the colonized Africans. You will of course remember that all we get, if, if you read the novel carefully, you will see that there is a lot of talk about oppression in Africa, there is a lot of, of, of sympathy even for the Africans who are oppressed, but all we get to hear about Africa is ultimately the voice of Marlowe and we cannot forget that Marlowe in spite of all his dislike for how colonialism was operating in the Congo region, was himself working there as an agent of the Belgian colonial authority. Therefore, if we read the novel from a genuine African perspective rather than from the perspective of a Westerner who is sympathetic 
seconds, we might arrive at a contrapuntal understanding of the novel and how it is itself informed by the very same prejudices that also informs the colonial discourse on Africa. But before trying to read the novel from this African perspective, we first need to better acquaint ourselves with some major points in African history and not only the history of colonial rule in, Af rule in Africa, sorry, but also the history of pre-colonial Africa. And for this I turn to this wonderful book titled African Perspectives on Colonialism, uh, which was written by the Ghanaian academician and political leader Albert Adubwahen. And uh, the reason I choose this book is not only because of the quality of scholarship that is there to be found in this book, but also because it is short and really very easily readable. So, if you can manage to get your hands uh, on this book, I would definitely encourage you to read this book in its entirety. Now, coming back to the African historical context, one of the most important dates which uh, will help us uh, explore this African context, both colonial and pre-colonial history, is the date 15th of November 1884. And what happened on this date? Well, on this date a conference started in Berlin, Germany. And this conference uh, was organized to decide the fate of the Africans and their territories and it lasted till the 31st of January 1885. Now, the decisions that were taken during these few months uh, of the conference were so momentous that it changed the political geography of African continent, of the entire African continent forever. And to get an idea about how big this change was, let us look at these two maps. So, on the left side, the map on the left side which shows how Africa looked politically just a few years before the Berlin Conference, you can see that most of the continent is divided into small tribal kingdoms, barring the large green patch here at the top, uh, which uh, of course is a part of the Ottoman Empire and the blue portion here at the top marked Algeria, which was a French colony. Apart from this, if you look down near the south of the continent, you can see a pink portion marked Cape Colony and this was the colony of the British. Now, look at the map on the right and the date and uh, both these maps, they have the dates on top of them. Uh, so, the first map is how Africa looked in 1880 and the second map uh, gives you the date 1913. And if you compare the first map with the second map, the difference is really startling. Because as you can see here, most of Africa uh, is now in 1913 divided into large chunks of territories and each of these large chunks of color patches, each of them represent the colony of one or the other European power. So, for instance, the large blue patch which starts from the north where Algeria is located and which continues down almost to the center of the continent represents the French colony in Africa. Uh, the pink patches throughout the continent, they represent the British colonies in Africa. Uh, 
and of course uh, this portion marked in violet is uh, the Congo region which was the Belgian colony in Africa and this is the place where uh, Conrad situates his heart of darkness. So, and apart from two areas, one marked in yellow here in the east of Africa. So, apart from these two areas, one here which represents the kingdom of Ethiopia and the other one here uh, which uh, is marked in uh, light blue uh, which represents Liberia. Apart from these two regions, the whole of Africa by 1913 was neatly parceled out as colonies of various European powers. Now, the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885 in which uh, this decision to parcel out this entire continent was taken, was attended by almost all the major western countries except America and Switzerland. But what is more important to note here is, and, and this is very ironic, that in this conference which decided the fate of the African continent for uh, decades to come, not a single African representative was present. So, no single African person was present during the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885. Uh, now, I am sure that such a situation today hits us as absurd. How can you decide the fate of an entire continent without any representative from that continent being there? But, it, I mean, yes, it is absurd, there is no denying that fact, but it is also, it, this fact also gives us a very important clue about how colonialism operates. We repeatedly refer to colonialism as a form of exploitation and oppression precisely because it does not enter into any form of consultation with the people whose resources and labor it uses to sustain its profit-making enterprises. Thus, within colonialism, the colonized subjects are always left without a voice. Now, as far as uh, the Berlin Conference was concerned, we also need to keep in mind that though it decided the fate of Africa and its inhabitants, the conference was never really motivated by any special concern about Africans. Rather, what the conference sought to achieve was a balance of power in Europe and a resolution of what is known as the scramble for Africa that had broken out in the 1880s. And this scramble for Africa is an important term for us uh, which will help us understand the African context better. And in order to explore this term scramble for Africa, we need to go behind the capitalist motives that guided the kind of colonialism that we are discussing in this course. So, from the very beginning I have been associating colonialism and colonial enterprise with capitalism, right? So, here I would be talking briefly about this connection between capitalism and colonialism as it related to Africa, African colonialism. So, let us start by asking ourselves the basic question, what is capitalism? Now, very simply put, Capitalism can be defined as investment of money or capital to make more money, that is profit. Now, Europe had started moving from a feudal mode of economy to a capitalist mode of economy from say around the 15th century. And it was of course a very gradual progress 
and uh, it this this progress towards capitalism and this progress of capitalism has passed through various phases and indeed even today capitalism is a force that is continuously renewing itself and uh, taking newer forms. But uh, in our discussion of the African context, the kind of capitalism that is most important is the one that is associated with the rise of the industrial mode of production. Right? So, by the 18th century, Europe had witnessed what is known as the industrial revolution, whereby the capacity of various European nations to produce commodities far surpassed the capacity of these nations to consume these commodities domestically. But these surplus products, uh, these surplus commodities were nevertheless produced to rake in huge amounts of profit. Now, when we are talking about profit uh, and capitalism, I want you to note a very interesting aspect of this profit, which is that in capitalism, the profit margin is something which is forever going down. What do I mean by this? Let us suppose that I am producing shirts in my industry and I am selling one shirt for 100 rupees. Now, in capitalism, there is always competition, which means that say tomorrow, another person might start producing the same shirt and might reduce his profit margin to 50 rupees and start selling that shirt to cut me out of the competition, which means that in future, I will have to reduce my profit margin further below 50 rupees to stay in the race. As a result, therefore, the profit margin within the capitalist mode of production, industrial mode of production is seen to be continuously deteriorating. Now, you can only sustain this ever lowering profit margin by two ways. One way is if you can keep increasing the market for your commodity. So, in other words, if earlier you got rupees 100 profit by selling one shirt to one person, in the change circumstances where your profit margin has come down to 50, say for instance, in order to make that same profit, you will have to sell the shirt to two persons. You will have, have to make two shirts and you will have to sell it to two people in order to get that profit. If your profit margin further declines, if it goes down to say rupee 1, then of course, you will have to find a larger market, which means that you will have to, in order to make rupees 100 profit, you will have to sell it to 100 people, right? So, by continuously increasing the size of your market, you can still rake in the same amount of profit that you were doing earlier before the competition. But another way, there is also another way which is usually coupled with this first way. Uh, to sustain the business in spite of a deteriorating profit margin and that is if you can find some way to reduce the price of raw material that goes into the making of a commodity. So, for instance, you can if, if you can somehow procure cotton at a reduced price, then even if the final price of your shirt has fallen down due to competition, you will still be able to make a profit because ultimately what is profit? Profit is the difference between the price of the raw material plus the labor charges that are required to make a commodity and the final selling price of the commodity. So, if you can find some way to reduce the price of the raw material and the labor input, then even if your final price is coming down, the difference is maintained and profit is maintained. Now, according to Albert Adubohan, the quest for a larger market and for cheap raw materials to feed the industries were the primary causes why Africa was colonized by the West. So, 
by the 19th century, industrial mode of production had become the norm for most of the European countries who were as a result because industrial mode of production had become a norm for them, they were perpetually searching for cheap raw materials as well as for a larger market for their produced goods. This made the continent of Africa especially alluring to the European countries both for its resources which till the 1880s had largely remained untapped by the European industries and for its potential as a market for European commodities. Now, at this point, I would like to point out that Africa since long had been a place from where the West had acquired slave labor for its industries. Uh, and this kept on going till slavery was banned in the West in the 1830s and the slave trade from Africa ended. But therefore, Europe was involved in one particular kind of trade with Africa even before 1880s, the trade of humans. Now, it is important to keep in mind that during this period of slave trade, the direct influence of western powers largely remained limited to the fringes of the African continent. But during the late 1870s, something new started happening. Two countries, France and Belgium, they started showing interest in expanding their colonial influence deeper within the continent. And this expansionist agenda of France and Belgium started causing a great deal of alarm amongst other major European powers like Britain for instance, like Portugal, like Germany because we will have to remember that all of them by 1870s were major industrial nations and they were therefore always in search for larger markets and cheaper raw material. And Africa therefore, they could not allow only two countries to colonize the entire continent. So, they also moved in. And this therefore, set out a kind of race between these western countries, uh, all of them, France, Belgium, Britain, Portugal, Germany, all of these countries became involved in a race to colonize Africa from say around 1880s. And this race is what is known as the scramble for Africa. The Berlin Conference held in 1884-1885 was an attempt by the European powers to settle amicably between themselves the conflict that inevitably accompanied this competition. Therefore, it is not entirely surprising that no Afri African representative was present there at the conference because the conference as I have told you earlier was ultimately a way to resolve the competition between European nations and the way that the conflict was resolved was by amicably cutting up Africa, the continent of Africa between themselves and sharing the large African cake as it were. But that is only one side of the story, is not it? We also have to ask how did the Africans react to this European attempt to divide up their lands into European colonies? Well, the reactions, African reactions were of course varied and some African kingdoms did establish alliances with various uh, competing European forces and they did that primarily to protect themselves, safeguard themselves against other hostile African kingdoms. But though there are these stories of alliances, the overwhelming African response to this European uh, colonization was of military resistance. And this resistance was met in the battlefield by advanced European 
military technology in the form of things like the grass repeater rifle, things like the Maxim gun which the Europeans had, the Africans did not and this really decimated the African military uh, that the Europeans encountered in the battlefield. And as a result, within a decade of the Berlin Conference, all major African kingdoms except Ethiopia and Liberia lost their independence and became European colonies. Now, as we know from our earlier discussion, this military colonization uh, which characterizes colonialism is inevitably accompanied by a colonial discourse, right, which transforms the bloody process of colonization into a civilizing mission, wherein Africans were presented not as victims of European oppression, rather they were portrayed as immature savages and barbarians who were about to benefit from the light of civilization that the European colonizers were bringing with them. Now, this is of course very well known to us. This is the colonial discourse as civilizing mission. However, Boahen points out in his book that contrary to this colonial discourse, the Africans who were subjugated by the Europeans were far from being savages and barbarians. Not only did they have a very long and rich cultural tradition, they were also thriving economically and socially till before 1880s when the scramble for Africa began and when their independence ended. Now, indeed by the 1870s, African kingdoms had largely shaken themselves out of the ill effects of slave trade that had plagued them till the 1830s and they had started prospering in terms of trade for instance. African societies were witnessing a more equitable distribution of wealth. The necessity of commerce had also started resulting in the development of infrastructure for instance wherein land and river routes were being linked to form large trade networks. African population was also increasing till before 1880s and this was a sign of progress because the slave trade had considerably depleted the African population. And of course, colonialism post 1880s was again going to reverse this population trend. The population was again going to go in decline which of course points at a general impoverishment of Africa and Africans. And finally, a lot of interesting experiments with constitutional politics was also going on in pre-colonial Africa, especially in places like Ghana before the Europeans forcibly came in to claim the whole of Africa for themselves and declared the Africans as savages and brushing all these signs of progress and development aside. Now, in our next lecture, we will return to the novel Heart of Darkness, but with this new awareness of the colonial and pre-colonial African context. And we will see how this African perspective can lead to a powerful contrapuntal reading of one of the most celebrated novels in British literature. Thank you. Thank you.